Hello everyone and welcome to the SJD show where I talk about anything and everything I find interesting usually from my trifecta of Formula One, Eurovision and Doctor Who. Today I'll be looking at Eurovision 2024 but first the news. So Formula One news then we had the Australian Grand Prix and it's probably the most exciting race of the year. Uh, so Formula Three Three, there's not really a lot to say about that. The championship leader Luke Browning had a pretty dismal weekend. Um, Leonardo Fornaroli is now kind of up there tied with him. He had a pretty good weekend uh, with a couple of points in the sprint race and second in the feature race, along with pole position. Um, yeah, Formula 3, I mean, good racing in Formula 3. Good racing are kind of across the board in Australia this year, actually. Some absolutely us. Downing overtakes into turn eleven. I uh, I wasn't the biggest fan of the of the changes that they made to the circuit in twenty was it twenty twenty two when they changed it. I think it was. Um, they took out one of the chicanes, and I I, I used to love it. I was like, well, that's not going to over. That's not going to increase overtaking. <laughs> God was I wrong. God was I wrong. The most favoured overtaking spot was in turn eleven. It's a fast sweeping left hander, and that's where people were doing overtakes, which meant you kind of still had to be brave. DRS got you up to, got you up to it, but you still had to get the move done. The kind of the usual typical overtaking point into turn um, into turn three was a, uh, well, I just kind of wasn't wasn't really the place. Uh, turn thirteen is usually a normal an overtaking spot as well, but no, not this year. It was great. Formula Two. Uh, Zay Maloney. I mean, he he just impressed me so much last time out. That, uh, sorry, in the first round. Uh, that I'm I'm kind of keeping a pretty close eye on him because I want him to do really really well. Uh, I don't really get the hype for Kimi Antonelli other than he's young and a Mercedes junior driver. I mean, he's he's is he even in the top five of the standings. No. Um. <clears throat> Dennis Hauger, you know, pole position, second in the sprint race, and then, uh, you know, has an accident in the feature race. So I mean, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't rate him as highly as as a lot of people do either. But Zay Maloney, I think, is smashing it. Ollie Behrman, frustratingly, after a brilliant, brilliant race in the Ferrari, uh, you know, qualified absolutely nowhere. Uh, you know, finished out the points in the sprint race, but managed to pick up a, literally two points in the feature race. So yeah, disappointing, disappointing weekend for for all the bearmen. Um, but again, the, the the actual racing was was sensational. I think Hajar was uh, oh, I think Hajar mm, probably didn't fully deserve the penalty he got in the sprint race. But I mean, come back and win the feature race is impressive. Uh, had he kept his sprint race win. He would now be second in the championship, but I think Hajar Kushmaini's been doing a cracking job as well this year, actually. But Zay Maloney is uh by by far and away impressed me the most so far this year. And it was nice to hear Alex Brundle stop saying that it was the car. <clears throat> For once. Formula One was a, a brilliant race as well, actually. A really, really brilliant race. Um so a couple of weeks ago, I did. Yeah, no, a couple of weeks ago, I did the qualifying championship. So an update on that: then Max Verstappen still at the top with seventy five points, having got three pole positions. And uh, then it's Charles Leclerc, Perez, Carlos Sainz Jr., Russell Norris, Piastri, Alonso, Hamilton in ninth with only six points in qualifying so far. Sonoda, Stroll, and Ukimbel, and the constructors. Qualifying championship, Red Bull is a lot further ahead at the top with 115, Ferrari 76, McLaren 48, Mercedes 33, Aston Martin 24, uh, RB Honda 6, Haas 1, Williams high of 12, Kick Sauber a high of 13th, and Alpine only a high in qualifying of 15th with Esteban Ocon. Pierre Gasly hasn't got out of Q1 yet. Hey, poor, poor form for Alpine, really, really poor form from Alpine. The race then, uh, really, really bizarre, really, really, really bizarre um, mechanical issue for Verstappen, meaning that he retired, I mean, pretty much on the first lap. 
um, his left, nope, his right rear brake uh, stuck on. So what that, what that, when, when he says that, what it means is effectively when you're driving, if you put the brakes on and then just don't take like, and then you're still driving, but with the brakes on, but just on his rear right. So, which inevitably meant that his brake caught fire and his tire blew up, and his race was his race was over. Um, interestingly, though, Perez said after the race that he didn't necessarily think that Max would have won the race anyway, and I'm inclined to agree with him. I think Max would still would have done a obviously he would have been a lot closer than fifty six seconds off the lead, a lot lot closer than that. Um, but I reckon I don't even know if Max would have split the Ferraris. But then, given how close Lando was, I think that the inherent pace of that Red Bull probably should have split the McLarens, and that's probably where Max would have been. But I, th I think I think Max probably. I mean, it's still Max Verstappen. Like he is the best driver on the grid at the moment. I reckon he probably would have been pushing Ferrari really, really hard. Like Ferrari didn't have a difficult job of getting that one to McLaren. You know, Lando did his best to to make it difficult for them, you know, only just under six seconds off the lead in the end, which is fantastic. But you know, we'll we'll never know. We'll never know. Um the Haas is getting two points which is amazing. Sunoda. I've got to say, last year I wrote him off completely, but I mean, given where Daniel Ricardo is at the moment, I, 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 I don't see Ricardo in the RB next year at this rate. I think this might be Ricardo's last season in F1. And Sunoda, I mean, where did he fit? I mean, he's still, you know, 40 seconds behind Perez in the end, but hey, if he, if he, if he keeps pulling in massive points, at the very least he'll keep his RB seat. But I think, uh, at this point, I think Red Bull would be smart to try and get Carlos and to have Verstappen and Carlos in that uh, in the Red Bull racing seat. And then, you know, Perez can be somewhere. But the thing is, if Perez... Well, no, the problem is what Red Bull really needed Perez to be doing was splitting the Ferraris, at the very least be ahead of both McLarens. And he wasn't. Now, there, is there an element of inherent pace in the car with that? Yeah, the, you know, they went the wrong way on setup. Red Bull full stop, I think, went the wrong way on setup with both cars. So, uh, it's tough. I mean, so far, Perez has done a great job, but he is now third in the standings. He's now behind Leclerc by one point. Max Verstappen's at the top with 51, Leclerc 47, Perez 46, Carlos Sainz 40 points. Oscar Piastri is up in fifth with 28. Which is amazing. Amazing job from him. Um, I think given the fact there was 30 seconds between Lando and Oscar at the end, they did the right thing swapping them around. I'm sure the Australian fans weren't too keen to not have Oscar on the podium, but that's, that's you know, it is what it is. And then right at the end of the race, we had that uh, bizarre incident with Alonso and, and, and Russell. Um... Now, to begin with, I I didn't think Alonso was at any fault. Alonso straight after was talking about uh, engine modes and, you know, all sorts of things that basically weren't him. And he was lying. Because the telemetry showed that he, he did break. Uh, and then accelerated again and then broke again into the corner and then accelerated out again. Saying, you know, stating that he was trying a different you know, thing or whatever, whatever random excuse that he decided to come up with. But for me, whether that was true or not is irrelevant to the fact that he initially said it was something else. So, like, he knew exactly what he was doing. So because he knew what he was doing, the penalty fits. Was it an, If it was an accident or anything like that, you know, maybe not. But the fact that he was he was doing something very, very purposeful no, I don't. Obviously, his intention wasn't to make George crash. His intention was just to try and make sure that George couldn't get past him using DRS, um, by hampering him into that corner. Uh, which you know, fine, but Alonso's uh, it's not the it's not the first time he's done that this season. So the penalty was deserved, and then you know there there's uproar from F one fans being like, oh, the FIA are intervening and mem and 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 it's not that dangerous. The dude fucking crashed. He crashed and flipped and was almost upside down. Like, e even let's just let's just take that out of the equation. Let's take what you know the 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 effect of what Alonso did out of the equation. 
if you are breaking a hundred meters earlier than you've ever done going into a corner that's huge what we we saw in was it 2010 uh mark weber launched over what either kate roman hrt i can't remember which but he launched over one of the cars that was going so much slower than he was expecting during the race because they you know they they lifted off way too early and mark went right up the arse of them Alonso himself, you know, went off, went up the back of Gutierrez in Australia, in the same place about eight years ago, and ended up in the wall for exactly the same thing because Gutierrez broke so much earlier than Alonso was expecting. So he knows, like he knows. Also, it's Fernando Alonso. He is the wiliest racer on the grid, and you know, if not ever. Um, so yeah, deserved penalty, absolutely. Red Bull at the top of the Constructors' Championship with 97 to Ferrari's 93. So, you know, fingers crossed this might actually turn into a into a, a, a proper championship challenge from the from the four drivers across Red Bull and Ferrari. We'll see. Um, I think it's probably not likely. I reckon Max is probably still going to walk away with the championship. But, hey, you never know. You never know. Uh, McLaren, a very distant third with 55, distant from Ferrari and distant from fourth place Mercedes, 26 to Aston Martin's 25. Mercedes are struggling to be the fourth best car this year. They genuinely might end up fourth or fifth. Last year, I think they just eked out second, didn't they? McLaren are very comfortable thirds. Uh, not where they were last year. They have fallen behind Ferrari, but... Ferrari have taken a massive, massive leap. Massive leap. Ferrari are a lot more competitive this year, which is good. Um, both Mercedes cars didn't finish for, you know, a reliability issue and then the accident. Uh, and the reliability, the, the reliability issue that Hamilton had. I mean, boof. Mm, Mercedes are... Tell you what, if Hamilton had any doubts in his mind about his move to Ferrari... You know, he had both of both of the cars and his team are retiring, and both of the team that he's going to, you know, got a one two. So I'm sure that assuaged any doubts that he had. But I don't think he would have had any. That you know, that Ferrari move is is brilliant. Uh, Doctor Who news. Um, I I thought the biggest thing this week would be that Stephen Moffat is writing an episode after all. Uh, after constantly saying that he, well, he never actually said he wasn't. He just kept dodging the question. Fair play to him. Um, Hitchcock esque apparently. Um, the director directed episode one and three. So either Moffat wrote the season opener, which I would doubt, or he wrote uh episode three, which I think is much more likely. Uh, and then we had the Doctor Who trailer, uh, which was fine. Um, I wasn't really expect. I mean, I, I was expecting another trailer. I must admit. I think it's a bit of a shame that Disney got it an hour before the rest of the world. Um, my wife pointed out, well, people that people would you know with Disney people will pay for it, which is why they would have got it before the rest of the world. But eh, yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not too keen on that at all. But hey ho, uh, trailer itself, I mean, shoot you will looks sensational as ever. Nice to see Mel and Kate doing some stuff. The fantasy element certainly has been increased. CGI looks spectacular, absolutely spectacular and bright and vivid. And you know, it's not trying to be dark and gloomy to hide you know mistakes. It's bold and in your face i think the shot of ruby sunday uh step on the butterfly and then like changing species completely was pretty good it's a bit of a comical like uh season 17 sound effect with the doctor gulping i hope that was just a funny thing for the trailer because that's definitely not the way we want doctor who going um but yeah otherwise i mean i wasn't particularly bowled away by it it's nice to have a trailer but uh Russell's keeping a lot close to his chest. And I, th I think in recent years, I've been used to trailers, you know, pretty much spoiling everything because no one was watching Doctor Who, so you need to try and pull people in. He knows that people are watching, so he doesn't need to give a thing away. He doesn't need to give a single thing away. Um, Oh, my Bridgerton's a pretty good line. Yeah. We'll see. I think, I think, <laughs> I think the thing is, for me, there wasn't a lot of villains or plot or it was a very much kind of action trailer of oh look this is doctor who now um whereas trailers in the past have been a little bit more focused on maybe what the story for the season is going to be or something like that um the one the one shot which did intrigue me a lot though was there was a hooded figure that turned around and had their hands sticking out and that looked to me 
like that was next to the church on Ruby Road. Um, it might not have been, but you never know. Jinx Monsoon looks incredible. Can't wait for the for the episode trailer with her, with her, with her because that looks great. Absolutely great. And that wraps it up for the news. So, <clears throat> and I mean, Eurovision news, not really anything other than all the entries have been picked. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to go through all the entries of Eurovision 2024. Now, me and my wife watched all of these together. Um, <clears throat> I set up a running order based on the way that uh, the Eurovision producers do it. So, you know, the idea is that you're starting strong, finishing strong, and that every song is, you know, has a chance to shine. So it's not like a whole batch of ballads and a batch of pop songs smooshed together for semi-final one and semi-final two. <clears throat> the Eurovision news, I guess, we did get was that the Big Five uh, and Sweden will be performing during the semi-finals. Now, I don't mean we're not seeing a clip and I don't mean they're like performing it as an interval act. They are part of the running order for semi-final one and semi-final two, which I think is fantastic. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant thing. I might have said this last week, but I think that is a brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, the next thing they need to do is, you know, scrap what they've done for the Big Five and bring in the one that I talked about a few weeks back. So the running order then for semi-final one as I did it was Croatia, Cyprus, Ireland, Serbia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Poland, Moldova, Australia, Finland, Sweden, Azerbaijan, Iceland, Germany, Luxembourg, Slovenia, Portugal and the United Kingdom. I have a scoring system which I have used since 2014 maybe uh, it got a pretty big revision a couple of years ago as such i am re-watching all of the all the eurovisions from 1956 onwards with the new system so a mark out of 10 for the actual song a mark out of 10 for the vocals the actual vocal performance a mark out of 10 for this for the actual performance the stage presence if you like and then a mark out of 10 for the visuals since the mid 2000s it is no longer just about you know are they wearing a nice dress are they wearing a nice suit are they is what they're wearing good for the song is there you know are they wearing a big penguin outfit it's a lot more you know how are they using the led lights what about the actual lighting do the colors match you know all that everything the visuals as a whole spectacle for example uh 2016's uh all of 2016's visuals looked amazing because of Sweden's stage. Uh, Russia's in in particular was was very very coherent and you know made brilliant use of the stage. Um, you know his outfit was simple, and then the visuals in the background you know helped with with everything, including you know the song and the big angel wings and all that stuff. So those are the four categories: then song, vocals, performance, and visuals. Out of ten meaning that every song has a possible score of 40. Starting with semi-final one then. So, Croatia. Baby lasagna with rim tim daggy dim. Hey, I'm a big boy now. I'm ready to leave. Ciao, mama ciao. Hey, I'm a big boy now. I'm going away. And I sold my cow. Favourite to win this. And... I watched the Croatian national final because I found out that uh, Let Three were in it again, and I wanted to see what they did. And it was basically Mamash, you know, but yellow. Um, so in this one, I had no idea what it was. I, ha I missed the performance of it, but I watched the the winners' reprise and was blown away. This song is spectacular. It's phenomenal. The song is amazing. It's got such a nice message about, you know, leaving for for uh, Western Europe and everything's going to be better, right? No. Um, his vocals are tremendous. There's a couple of iffy notes in the first half just while he's warming himself up. His stage presence is insane. His dancing is incredible. The visuals of everything is amazing. When he... When they do the little drop where everything goes green and he's doing this weird like pumping action with his hand. Oh, it's many feet. If he nails his vocals on the night, will be a perfect 40 from me. As of now, 10, 9, 10, 10. 39 out of 40 for Croatia. Second up then was Cyprus. Now, 
some of these there wasn't a live performance to judge so what my wife suggested and i think it's i think it's fair was to give it you know whatever mark it would be because you can't really judge a live vocal on a music video so it's more about the tone of the voice um sometimes even on sometimes even in a music video the voice sounds rubbish um, so you're just going around how you know how do you like the sound of their voice basically and then half it so that the maximum we can give a music video would be five so cypress celia capsis with liar waking up in the morning and i'm i'm feeling like ooh la la it's about to go down because i found out the truth la la nine o'clock in the morning and i know this is our last night i know what i'm doing because yeah i got it on black and white uh cypress found their niche a few years ago with fuego and replay and this is basically just replay replayed um i'm sure the, the the song itself is good it's a very good song cypress you know rarely miss the mark when they send a uh you know a dance track um yeah and you know looks like she can dance but generally i mean it, it's tough because it's a music video Live, I'm sure I'll like it a lot more. So 8, 4, 7.5, and 4. I gave this a total of 23.5 out of 40. Ireland then. Bambi Thug with Doomsday Blue. I guess you'd rather have a star than the moon. I guess I always overestimate you. Who do all the things that you do? I'm down, down in my Doomsday Blues. Very, very unique entry from Ireland this. Uh... I would say it's up there with Norway in terms of uniqueness. Um, interestingly, where I put this in the running order hurt it a lot. Uh, so, I mean, good luck to the Eurovision producers, you know, to try and put Ireland somewhere good. It's going to be hard. It's a really, really hard song to know where to put. Uh, you know, could you open with it? I think it's a bit too weird to open Eurovision. Especially semi-final one, um, maybe put it a bit more in the middle. But anyway, yeah, I, th I think where I put it hard a bit, um, because this was an early favorite for me and my wife. We absolutely love this song. She's she's a great performer, um, the vocals are patchy, at best, but still good, uh, and the visuals are absolutely spectacular. Like the 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 outfit that our that our backing dancers are wearing. And the dancing they do is so creepy. It's so, so, so cool. Uh, so 8, 7, 8, 10. Giving Bambi Thug and Doomsday Blue Ireland 33 out of 40. Serbia then. Teodora with Ramonda. Everything is quiet, just like underwater. I scream, but it's mute. There's a white glow behind the mountains. I see no end in sight. This is the road for wounded. Um... It's it was alright this. Um she was she had a good vocal. Uh the visuals were absolutely spectacular. But I think I think the problem with the song is just a bit dull and lyrics are fine, but at the end of the day she's singing about a flower. So eh. Six point five, seven, seven, ten. Giving Serbia thirty point five. Lithuania then, so Vestra Belt with Luktel, which is uh, wait for a little bit. Am I still alive? Do you recognise me still? The sun isn't rising. Tell me, will you stay near? This is an absolute banger of a song. This is an absolute banger of a song. It's a proper dance track. The vocal isn't overly challenging, which is good because it doesn't need to be. The The, the staging is gorgeous. The, it's flooded with red. Uh, his vocal is good. Again, it's not, it's not a tough song to sing. So it's not overly challenging. The dancing's pretty good. <clears throat> he could probably give it a touch for energy. Um and Malma than he gave in Lithuania. Uh but yeah, this is an absolute, absolute brilliant song. 10, 7, 8, 10. 35 out of 40 for Lithuania. Ukraine. Aljona, Aljona, and Jerry Heil with Teresa and Maria. With us, Mama Teresa and Diva Maria walked world through barefooted and bladed splinters. With us, Mama Teresa, Diva Maria, all the divas were born as all human beings. Now, this is... Every year, there's a grower. The one that me and my wife remember best is Belgium 21. 
uh, Hoover Phonic, um, the wrong place. When we first heard that in semi final one, thought it was crap. I barely, I hadn't listened to it at all before May. Uh, we were like, how the hell did I get to the final? Come the final, it was one of his favorite songs. <laughs> And Ukraine's is something pretty similar. Uh, when we first watched it, um, and it's the first time I've watched the whole thing, and our thoughts were, this is a, like, this is a pretty boring song. The vocals are fine. Uh, hated the performance. Couldn't stand the fact that Jerry couldn't stand still. Uh, and thought the visuals were dull. That was our first impression. Four, five, one, three. 13 out of 40 is what I gave this. Since then, massively changed opinion. Massively. The song itself is brilliant, frankly. it's It's got a brilliant little hook. Whilst I think the artist, I think Jerry's a bit... I think Jerry's a bit preachy. I'm not a fan of her. I, I didn't like their like post, post one interview of, oh, it's really important for Ukrainian culture that people vote for us. Like, mm, nah, fam. Um, I think the vocal... I've got much more appreciation for what she's able to do with her voice. It is very impressive, similar to Jamala. Might not be up my street, but it's very impressive. Uh, we uh, we realised when we played the song itself, we both started doing Jerry's Dancing in the Garden because there's kind of nothing else she can do with it. That's kind of what the song is pushing you towards. So I kind of forgave her for that. And then all of that and knowing the lyrics and all that stuff, the visuals then kind of make sense as well. Yeah, so I think if I was to revise this, it'd probably be closer to eight, eight, five, probably eight, eight, five, five, going at 26 instead of 13, um, which, yeah, but, but double the points, basically. It's, it's a lot better than, than we first thought. Next up then is Poland, Luna with the tower. I'm the one who built the tower. I'm the one who holds the power. So come on, rise up, shout it louder. I'm the one who built the tower. Uh, another music video, uh, this one. So tough to judge the vocals. Uh, tough to judge everything, actually. This It wasn't a very good music video. Didn't really understand why she just kept playing chess and failing. And it was, yeah, not great. The, the song itself is fine. I mean, it's, not, it's nothing special. Uh, the vocal was fine, nothing special. The performance, like the, the the presence in the video was nothing special. And the visuals, you know, I don't know how many points it took off for chess. So 5.5, 2.5, 4 and 2. Giving this a 14 out of 40. Uh, Moldova then, Natalia Barbu with In the Middle. I want you to be happy all of your life, my beautiful angel, a work of art. You live for sunshine, spread it around. I know your heart is filled with love. Uh, fight was better. Much better. 17 years ago, uh, she represented Moldova with Fight, and Fight was brilliant. That was like a proper little pop rock song with a pretty cracking key change. This is weird squealing with two microphones for absolutely no reason whatsoever. A violin, which makes no sense, and then a random up the octave jump, which she doesn't, which she doesn't nail. The song's not great. Uh, the stage present. I hate this. I hate the performance of it, and I think the visuals are boring. Four, five, two, two, giving this thirteen out of forty. Australia then. Electric fields with one mul Kali, uh, which is one blood. What are you gonna do in the real world, Mickey? That's Mickey Mouse. What are you gonna do when you see mul Kali, mul Kali Kuchu, mul Kali? Escape with us to the planets, the Fleetwood Max and the Janets, mul Kali La, while entertaining the gods. Uh, song seemed really strong. Song seemed good. I've listened to it since, and it's it's not as I was kind of hoping it would be better, but certainly at the time, you know, just a music video. Uh, song's fine. Vocals seem that they're going to be fine. Again, obviously, we're having it because it's a music video. Performance was shocking. It's just the two two heads doing doing fuck all for the whole three minutes. And weird, 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 weird. And as such, the visuals took a hit as well. Um. But, you know, the song's the strongest part, which, you know, it is the Eurovision Song Contest, after all. So 7.5314, giving this 15.5 out of 40. Finland then, Windows 95 Man with No Rules. No Rules, it's how I live. How I find the wind beneath my wings. It's how I learn to fly. 
and the heat of the night, and the thrill of the fight. I don't even care what's wrong or right. It's how I live my life. No rules. A lot of energy. Very, very, very upbeat uh, song. Windows 95 Man, effectively being the Finnish version of Gunther from Sweden. Famous for... Um, oh, you touch my tra-la-la. Uh, who actually was, he was in Finland's national final seven years ago. Uh, with a song that was better than this. Um, but the singer wasn't as good. Uh, the, the guy who sings for Windows 95, man, he's, 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 he's pretty decent, actually. He does a, he does a half-decent job. Uh, it's a very good song. It's not as good as, as Cha Cha Cha, obviously, but it's a good song. Um, the vocal, I mean, it leaves a lot to be desired, but it's not dreadful. Uh, the performance, it's, it's, it's tough to, it's tough to deny. It's, it's brilliant. It's high octane. When he gets it, when he puts his, when he puts his denim shorts on and he's got the two little, he's got the two little whips that are, that are, you know, shooting sparks out. It's just fucking hilarious. Um, yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, I don't like all the denim. It's not my thing. My wife, I think, gave the... The visuals a ten because she was like, "Look, it's just it's it's so unique. I've got to love it." And I was like, "Fair enough, it is unique, but I don't like it." So eight four eight five, giving Finland's entry twenty five out of forty. Sweden, Marcus and Martinez with unforgettable. She gone chew you up and leave you empty hollow. Then she'll spit you out anyway. I follow. She gone hurt you bad, but it feels so good. I don't care. No, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> but as middle of the road you can be this. Song's fine, vocals were fine, performance was fine, visuals are fine. Actually, the visuals were a lot better than I think I gave him credit for. Um, it kind of harkens back to, you know, six, seven years ago when Sweden was just kind of sending um, dance pop, which was fine. Like, I Can't Go On is far better. Uh, Benjamin and Grosso's song was much, much better. Uh, even Franz was better than this. Uh well, you know, th th it's growing on me a bit. The song is growing on me. It's a good song to listen to, and I guess that's the point. And, you know, Marks and Martinez, uh, the Norwegian duo, they are extremely popular across Scandinavia. Um, and uh, it's kind of a surprise that they haven't been in Eurovision yet. I first came across them about six or seven years ago with their song Bay. Um, they're, they're good. They're, they're strong. They are strong. I, I think their dancing could have been a little better, actually. I think that's why I've only given them so sevens across the board for Sweden. Uh, twenty eight out of forty. Uh, but that could change a lot. Um, on the night, Azerbaijan, Fari featuring Ikan Dovletov with Ozun Apar, uh, which is "Take Me Away with You." Uh, "Take Me Away with You." Without you, this universe is too narrow for me. Um, pretty boring song. Very good singer. Wife loved his voice. Um. Uh, performance tough to judge visuals it was all orange it was a music video again so uh, a pretty very very boring entry from azerbaijan i have to say sometimes sometimes they can you know take your breath away and sometimes they can uh so three three point five three and three twelve point five for azerbaijan's entry this year iceland with hera bjork scared of heights i feel it coming been here before and never got it right baby i'm wondering a falling in love has got me scared of heights. Probably the worst entry Iceland's ever sent. This is shocking. This is a shocking, shocking entry. Uh, the national final didn't have a lot to to live up to anyway. Um, I talked. I've talked a lot over the few weeks about how Iceland were one of the favorite. You know, they were starting to creep up the favorites to win because there was a Palestinian singer in the national final. And honestly, I think you should have sent him. I think his song's better. I haven't listened to it. His song's better. I haven't seen the performance. His performance is better. This is just, if like, especially for, for Hera Bjork, like 15 or oh, 14 years ago, she was upset in Iceland with a song called Je ne sais quoi, which is phenomenal. It's a proper, like, you know, back 2008, you know, disco trance song with Euroband, 2009, stunning power ballad that came second, 2010, disco trance song with Hera Bjork, 2011, eh, you know, Shawnee's Friends, which is, which is a good enough song. Uh, zero for song, two for vocal, zero for performance, two for visual, four out of 40 for Iceland. I think that's my lowest score this year. 
Germany then, Isaac with Always on the Run. Run from the silence, screaming for guidance. Who am I fighting for? Get out of my head. I'm so sick and tired. Can't do this anymore. What a surprise this was from Germany. What a surprise. The only country that consistently does worse than us. And uh, the thing is, when Germany, when Germany do it right, they do it right. The last time they sent something this good was Michael Schultz. Um, you let me walk alone? Ever walk alone? Anyway, a stunning song from Germany. It came fourth that year, I think. Um, and this is... I don't think it's as good as that, but, I mean, this is left-hand side of the board for Germany, surely. Uh, the song's great. His vocal is outstanding. His vocal is absolutely outstanding. The best we've had so far. Uh, you know, his performance, his presence is incredible. And the visuals are great. You know, it's just him standing there with what he's wearing. They don't try and... As long as they don't Eurovision this up, they just leave him to it. This could do really, really well. 8, 10, 9, 8. 35 out of 40 for Germany. Luxembourg making their mediocre return after 30-odd years. Uh, tally with fighter. You're not 20 anymore. You don't have time anymore. To be a child, to have a party. You have no more money, no momentum. You're really going straight towards the defeat. It's <laughs> a great lyric. Boring song. Boring vocal. Not a great vocal at all. The performance, uh, one of the things that my wife hates in Eurovision is when the main singers like half arson it and the back and dancers are kind of carrying them. And that's exactly what she's doing. And the visuals are fine. Very, very weak entry from Luxembourg. Very, very weak entry. Kind of expected more from them. I mean, given, given the production value of the national final, you kind of expect something a lot better than this. Um, but yeah, three, two, three, four. Given this a uh, grand total of 12 out of 40. Uh, Slovenia then, Raven with Veronica, find me, wound me, defend me, when you chase me, when you abandon me, lift me up, release me, love me, who chases you, makes you afraid of me. Uh, now we did find a live version of this, but I've since realised that it isn't, an accu isn't accurate to the music video, because it's like a, just a piano version, um, but it was shit, song shit, and you can't, you know, you can try and polish a turd, but it's still shit. Uh, her vocal was fine. The performance was absolute crap. Her stage presence is shit. And the visuals were fast. I think she was wearing quite a nice dress. I can't remember. It didn't leave any impression on me at all. Zero, two, one, four, seven out of 40 for Slovenia. Portugal. Yolanda with Grito, which is shout. Today I want to prove to myself that I can be whatever I want. To bring together those who loved me at a table. To forgive anyone who wanted to see me suffer. They can't fool me. Um... This is one of the rare times where the song is pretty meh, but everything around it elevates it to extreme heights. So the song is pretty boring, but her vocal is flawless. The performance across the board is stunning and the visuals are breathtaking. Portugal have picked a boring song, but if they keep the stage in, this, this could do really, really well. Now, it is the song contest, so it might not even qualify in the end because the song's a bit meh, but everything else, and this is why I have the four categories, everything else matters. It does matter. Now, the reason why, I'll do that in a second, actually. Yeah, so 5, 10, 10, 8.5, giving this 33, yeah, giving this 33.5 out of 40. Lastly, in the first semi-final then, the United Kingdom. Ollie Alexander with Dizzy. So won't you make me dizzy from your kisses? Will you take my hand and spin me round and round until the moment never ends? Uh, I love this song. I absolutely love it. Um, I think this this is the best song The best song we've sent since Space Man with Sam Raider. Now, I have a bit of a propensity with UK acts to, if I love them, they're going to do crap. If I don't like them, they do quite well. Um, Lucy Jones being the only real uh, uh, different thing with that uh, outlier is what the word I'm looking for um, Molly's Children of the Universe I wasn't a fan of that did alright, I mean we weren't last um, Electro Velvet Still in Love With You, I love that song with a burning passion, it was shocking live uh, Suri with Storm, I adored Joe and Jake was amazing, I can't believe that did as badly as it did 
Um, Michael Rice, surprised, you know, we, we did as badly with that. Sam Ryder, I wasn't that fussed on the song because it's not my, it's not my thing. Um, you know, it's very, very Queen inspired, um, pop rock ballad, uh, which just, which isn't the sort of thing I normally like. But I gotta say, on the night, he, he, he turned me around to it. It was brilliant, and I was so proud that we did as well as we did. Uh, I loved Mamie. I loved Embers. You know that somehow got no poa, <laughs> no poa in this voting system. Like, how is that even possible? Um, and I loved wrote a song. The problem with both of them is they couldn't sing live. Like they could not sing live to save themselves. All they can. So the live version of this then, the song is, like I said, I love the song. I absolutely love it. And I thought vocally he was almost perfect. Almost perfect. Uh, the live version, you know, the staging isn't, the, the, there's not a lot really going on. And it's just them on a stage, um, you know, with a camera moving around and a couple of lights. So in terms of, you know, visuals and performance is not accurate to what we're going to get on the night, but I've got to judge what I saw. So 9.5, 9.5, 5.6. So UK is hurt a fair bit by the live version that we watched, but in spite of that, 30 out of 40 at this stage for Ollie Alexander and the United Kingdom. And that brings to an end semi-final one. So... <clears throat> From last to first, then, my bottom five, and therefore the five that I don't think should qualify, are Iceland, Slovenia, Luxembourg, Azerbaijan, and Moldova. With four to 13 points, respectively. Now, the three automatic qualifiers obviously aren't part of this, but there are 18 entries. Uh, three of which go straight through, 10 which have to fight for their place, which means we lose five entries from semi-final one. Those are the five that I think shouldn't make it. So 13th place, I have uh, Ukraine. Like I said, that would now be up in my top 10. Uh, Poland in 12th, Australia in 11th, Cyprus in 10th, Finland in 9th, Sweden in 8th, UK in 7th, Serbia 6th, Ireland 5th, Portugal 4th, Germany 3rd, Lithuania 2nd, Croatia 1st with 39 points. Lithuania and Germany tied, both with 35 points. Now... The reason my four categories are done in the order they are is that's the order of importance. The song is the most important thing in the Eurovision Song Contest. The vocal is the next important thing in the Eurovision Song Contest. The stage performance, the presence, is the third most important thing in the contest. And the visuals is the least most important thing. But it's still important. It is still important. A good song can be ruined by someone wearing something daft. The only time... I can think of where that didn't hold true with Celine Dion and her ridiculous tutu. So if there is a tie, you're going left to right. So song is the most important thing. Whichever whichever of your two has the highest score in song, that's what goes ahead. Then vocal, then performance, then uh, visual. If across the board is exactly the same, go with your gut. Go with what your heart tells you. So I did say that I watched this with my wife as well. Now, well, I won't go over exactly what she had our top you know whatever um our bottom five does look different because ukraine is in there like i said ukraine would would move up and australia would replace it so bottom five slovenia iceland moldova azerbaijan ukraine then australia luxembourg poland Cyprus, Serbia, Sweden in 8th, Finland, Ireland, UK, Portugal, Lithuania, Germany, Croatia. No ties there. No ties there. Croatia at the top with 73 points between the two of us out of 80. Germany in 2nd with 67. Down at the bottom with Slovenia with 22 out of 80. That concludes semi-final one, <clears throat> um, which is as much as I'm going to do today, just so that this isn't a ridiculously long ridiculously long uh podcast so we'll do semi-final two next week uh which means we're moving on to what's sean up to what am i up to uh restart our brooklyn 99 one of my favorite shows on the planet absolutely love it uh it's quite interesting watching it at the moment and seeing that it's only only 10 years ago that started but it's already problematic 
and in a in a much more obtuse way than than stuff from the nineties and early two thousands, like The Office and Friends. Like they're they're problematic in their own ways. This is problematic in a very different way. Uh but it kind of showcases what humor was was like ten years ago. And I don't think it's problematic in a sense that, you know, it should I don't believe in things being cancelled or any crap like that. Um but I think it's just interesting seeing seeing Jake as such a flawed character. And he is a problematic character. He has a very um prejudiced outlook on the world which you know that's the point of his character and then that changes as you know over the over the seasons come season four he's a he's a white knight he's brilliant um and i think because i know jake like that because he is that for most of the show it's quite jarring to go back to season one and be like whoa you are so different like you roll so much which is amazing it's amazing um, <clears throat> last week I mentioned that I'd kind of rejigged how I pick what video games to play, which I have done. Uh, I have started, played, and finished a game called Luminous Avenger IX, uh, which is very much kind of like Metroidvania game. Um, ironically, I don't like Metroid, but I love all the Metroidvania game, like I love all the variations on the theme. Uh, it's a two D scrolling shooter. Uh, with with brilliant bosses that are tough, only took a couple of hours to complete the whole thing. It was brilliant. Uh, I've been playing Soul Calibur Six. Now I I played the original Soul Edge, uh, in lockdown. Um, I got a PS Two in lockdown and found the the original disc for about tenner, uh, and loved it. I loved it. I think the 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 thing that I miss from that Street Fighter to me is just absolutely boring. Tekken is fine, but Tekken's missing something for me these days, which Soul Calibur absolutely has. And I think it's the weaponry. I think it's it's just the the like the ability to to pull off interesting attacks is a lot easier in Soul Calibur. But it's 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 a lot easier to pick up and go. And it feels easier to master, but it's absolutely not. And that is kind of the point of of, um, you know the 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 one versus one fighting game. I can't remember the, the exact name of the genre, but Soul Calibur I think is a brilliant change on it. There's also like this weird adventure mode thing which I'm in the middle of, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then there's a story mode, and then there's the typical arcade mode. There's a lot of content in Soul Calibur Six. I know there's an online thing as well, but I'm not too fussed on that. Um, I've been playing Wild Arms, the very first Wild Arms. I briefly touched Wild Arms three. Uh, a couple of years ago, but didn't leave much of an impression on me, but I'm excited to get back to it because Wild Arms is fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic for the time it came out as well. It is, it bridges the gap between Final Fantasy VI and Final Fantasy VII in terms of uh, graphical quality, in terms of gameplay, in terms of story. Uh, you start as, like, the opening prologue is, is, is three different characters, who you have to fight a boss basically, and then you all meet in the same place, and then you join up, and then it's just three of you off to f fight the world. Um, but it's on a it's on a pixelated two D plane, unless you're in a fight, and then it switches to fully rendered three D graphics. But so it's literally like a, it's a stepping stone between Final Fantasy VI's fully pixelated two D graphics and then uh two D artwork to Final Fantasy VII's fully rendered 3D uh, models, sometimes on, you know, on 2D backdrops, uh, but then the fights themselves with 3D. And it's turn-based as well, um, like classic turn-based. Oh, it's, it's it's really, really good. I really enjoy it. There's also like a, a, like, a, um, like a Legend of Zelda element in it as well, because like you're different, like one character has bombs, which you can place to blow to blow like a hole in a cave so you can go like blow a wall up in a cave so you can go and like find hidden treasure in there uh one guy has a, a i think i think it's called an air mouse so if you are say there's there's an unassailable trap that you can't get past but there's a treasure chest on the other side you can send your mouse to get it uh there's a late there's um the the mage princess has a device which turns time back which effectively just resets puzzles if you get it wrong and she has um 
like a little an emblem which opens opens doors that has the emblem on it basically that's a bit more like plot related but the bomb and the mouse are incredible uh, i've also been playing a game called necromunda uh i've, I've stumbled across some absolutely crackers this week um necromunda is oh gosh how did how did i describe it it's like fire emblem or uh what the games are like it. Uh, Dennis Warriors God Seekers is the same. Dennis Tactics. Uh, Mario and Rabbids. <laughs> um, I don't know what the genre would be, but effectively, you you, <clears throat> it's it's turn based. But there are, say, you've got three characters, and on on one character's turn, they have a set amount they can move. They have a set amount of action points and a certain amount of movement points. And you can move, you know, up to the point that the movement is is done. And then, you know, say you want to shoot a gun. Let's say that costs 20 action points. And then you've got 20 left. So you can shoot your gun again or you can do something else. So you can, like, activate some controls. Um, normally, I, I, I know that on, um, like, grid-based levels. Like, Mario and Fire Emblem are very much, you know, you can move five. Uh, Digimon Survive is exactly the same. And I fucking love Digimon Survive. Uh, you know, so you can move five squares up and two squares left maximum. You've got you know, seven squares of movement that you can do. And then you have an attack which has a range of one square either side of you. Or, you know, it can be three squares up and, you, you know, you hit the opponent and then there's that. That's what I know this as. And this is that exact type of gameplay, but you've removed the squares. You completely removed it. So and and like the, the 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 it's 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 darker grittier. Uh, you're like a group of um, you're playing as a group of. I mean, I, I tend to skip the story and all these because what I care about most is gameplay. Uh, and saying that Wild Arms' story is 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 pretty good so far, but I haven't really got anywhere with it yet. Um, yeah. So Necromunda, uh, you're like a group of mercenary women, um, who are fucking shit up, and it's great. Absolutely great. Uh, there's lots of different like troop types that have different abilities. Uh, the level I just played, there's one you um you start and you've got a whole turn before enemy reinforcements turn up, and there are choke points where you've got to set traps or like build barricades, uh, which I did a very bad job of, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's just, it's an incredible game. So Necromunda, Soul Calibur Six, and Luminous Avenger IX. If you have a uh, PlayStation and you have PlayStation Plus, just essential, uh, not essentials, extra. Maybe you need the maybe you need premium. I don't know if you have if you have a version of PS Plus. These are three games that are coming off of PS Plus next month. So alongside. My, you know, going through all the games I've got available to me, of which there's about 700 at the moment, um, you know, in release date order. Uh, I will also take the, all the games that are leaving PlayStation Plus next month and I will play them so that I've got an opportunity. Luminous Avenger IX was a wonderful surprise. So Calibur 6, I was expecting it to be good and thankfully it was. And Necromunda, I didn't know what to expect and it is just sensational. So I'd recommend absolutely every single one of them. And that's the podcast for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, please do get in touch or leave a comment or you know like or subscribe or whatever it is that you do on the platform you're listening to this on. Uh, do get in touch, though, with your thoughts on, on everything, really. Uh, what do you think about the scoring system that I have in place? What do you think about the running order that I had? Uh, what do you think? I mean, by next week, we might have the actual official running order. Um, what do you think about the scores I gave everything, the rankings I give everything, the five qual the five uh songs that I don't think will qualify? Uh yeah, I think that is everything. Uh potentially, yeah. So next week we will we will do semi-final two of Eurovision 2024. We'll go through again, you know, exactly the same as what we did this week. Uh, you know, song, this is who it is, uh, you know, a little lyrical snippet as well like Terry Wogan used to do for us back in the day. I remember talking way back in the day, like 70s, 80s. Um, he stopped doing that in the late 90s. Uh, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, yeah, so, like I said, next week, second part of Eurovision 2024. But until then, take care, and I'll see you next time on the SJD Show.